Welcome to The Real Faith Podcast with me, your host, Chris Goins, a podcast featuring real talk with real people about God, theology, and life. Our goal, authentic, vulnerable, and raw conversations on a variety of topics with a view towards looking at what God's Word has to say. These conversations will help you apply your faith in God's Word to the real challenges of life. With that, let's jump into today's episode. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Real Faith Podcast, episode one, season one. (laughs) My name is Chris, and I really hope today's episode helps you apply God's word to the earth shaking, history shaping events going on in this world. On this week's episode, I'm joined by my friends, Montequa Petway and Freddie Effinger, mm-hmm. and we're going to have a wide-ranging conversation on race, ethnicity, and faith. Now, I want to introduce these people to you. Uh, Janet and I have known Montequa. Montequa, what we were thinking about this, I think, since 2004 or five. Yeah. So that's like 15 years. It's a long time. <laughs> Which is amazing. <laughs> and uh, Freddie became a part of the A2 Church family. Uh, in 2017. Mm-hmm. 17. So these two people not only attend A2, but I'm really honored to call them friends. Both mm-hmm. Montequa and Freddie are really high performing professionals. <laughs> now, I've got That's to so tell much you, more true of Montequa. <laughs> I've got to tell you about these two. Montequa currently serves as the director of human resources at the Grand Bohemian Hotel in Mountain Brook. This is one of the most beautiful hotels you will ever visit. If you live in Birmingham, you need to go visit. It's beautiful. She completed her bachelor's at the University of Montevallo, her master's at Webster University. She has, as you can see, an infectious smile. (laughs) Montequa, you are like the quintessential people person. I don't believe there's a person that you've not met or somehow (laughs) don't know. You're amazing in that way. And she has a true desire to optimize God's people. She's a strong supporter of the community. She serves as a board member for Big Brothers, Big Sisters in Greater Birmingham. And I love this, Montequa, because you and I share a little bit of life experience in this area. She works to educate ex-offenders on interview job readiness and employment retention skills. Having had a brother who came out of the system, I'm so thankful for people like yourself Mm. who invest in that area. Uh, Freddie. Freddie is an attorney at law at Friedman Law Firm. He completed his bachelor's at Oberlin College, his law degree at the University of Alabama School of Law. (laughs) He is a licensed attorney with the Alabama Bar Association. He's also a registered mediator. He has a diverse legal career. Listen to this. This is amazing. Involving civil and complex litigation, criminal work as a deputy a deputy da and working in the area of disability law the dude is crazy smart i kid you not (laughs) and he happens to be a gifted singer one of my favorites man (laughs) and you can't see him he's off camera but our producer today is chris miller who's also a graduate of the university of alabama Guys, I am officially <laughs> over my head. Oh, my goodness. Now, Montequa, Freddie, we are making history. This yes. is episode one, season one yeah. of the Real Faith Podcast. You are our first guest, and I hope that hints at the level of respect yeah. I have for you both and the importance of the topic we're going to be discussing because we're uh-huh. diving deep today. Uh-huh. We're going to talk about the current crisis taking place in our nation And we're going to talk about the issues of race, ethnicity, justice, faith, honor. And I really, at the outset, want you to know you have permission to be vulnerable and authentic. Um, I want our listeners to know today's conversation is going to be open, raw, real, vulnerable. And because everyone in this room, including our producer, he has a microphone and I've invited him to join in with us because everyone in this room is feeling, thinking and intelligent human beings. We may not always agree with one another. That's right. 
that's okay. Yeah. Right. In fact, I think it's important and I think it's healthy. In those instances where we don't agree, I pray that we will honor the ethic of the great German theologian, Lutheran theologian in the 17th century. He said this, in essentials, we have unity. In non-essentials, we have liberty. Mm-hmm. And in all things, we show love. Amen. Right. That's what we're aiming right. about. Uh, Montigua <laughs> and Freddie, thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> thank you. It's an, it's an honor. Absolutely. Uh, let's start at the beginning. Let's do it. I want our audience <laughs> to get a snapshot of your life, where you were born, yeah. raised. I'd love to hear a piece of your story. And Montiqua, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, born and raised in Inslee, Alabama, a place uh, people familiar with the city of Birmingham refer to as the West Side. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and interestingly enough, uh, in Inslee, Uh, It wasn't known for being a city that was very wealthy. In fact, if you came from Inslee, you were considered to have been doing well if you worked for the post office. Uh, the the steel plant wow. and or maybe Blue Cross Blue Shield. Wow. Yeah. Um, that was uh, the, the that was the epitome of success. <laughs> Uh, very low to marginal income families, wow. but we were all rich in love. Wow. Uh, educated at Council Elementary School wow. and then on to Jackson Olin. And I'll say my mom was a very deliberate woman, mm-hmm. um, very structured. In fact, I thought that maybe she had been in the military at some point in her life, <laughs> um, the way she <laughs> reared me. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, um, but that was not the case. But my mom instilled in me very early on, it doesn't matter where you go. It matters what you do. Mm-hmm. Wow. And that has stuck with me uh, since being a very small child, being a very young child. Um, I was in a household where relationship with Christ was key. But interestingly enough, as a child, I never saw my mom go to church. Wow. But my mom always sent me hmm. to church wow. with wow. my grandparents. Wow. And it was very important um, to her wow. that I had that foundation. Uh, my mom was 16 when she got pregnant with me. Wow. And I didn't understand hmm. it as a, as a young girl, but now as a woman, I understand my mom was on an assignment to ensure that I was everything that she hmm. was not. Wow. And wow. that wow. in lies, that's where um, the sternness, the rigidity, mm. uh, the very structured, disciplined woman that she was because she was on an assignment yeah. to make sure um, that I fulfilled the things that she did not. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. beautiful. A yeah. few years ago, your mother yeah. passed. That's right. And I had the opportunity to help officiate Absolutely. in that ceremony with yeah, several of the right. distinguished ministers. Yeah. It was one of the most beautiful homegoing celebrations Thank you. I've ever been a part of. Yeah. Uh, there was actually a spirit of worship there. Absolutely. Oh, it was beautiful. Absolutely. Thank you. Freddie, uh, tell the people a little bit about yourself. <laughs> um, first off, thank you for having me. I think this is an absolutely incredible opportunity. Um, We're on I, I grew up in uh, Woodlawn, so... We were the east side. <laughs> uh, you know, it was it was an interesting thing. My mother is, oh, she was, uh, after 30 years, she retired, but she was an educator. And uh, my father was a juvenile detention center officer. Wow. And, you know, it's always kind of funny to watch. And when I tell people that, they usually think that it would be my dad that would be the disciplinarian of the two. <laughs> but not even remotely. Uh, My mom was the one that made sure my brother and I, we did our homework, that we were doing what we were supposed to do and that we weren't sneaking off, that we weren't thinking about girls too much or she could control it, uh, doing everything that she could. My dad, uh, you know, he worked from, uh, his shift was actually from 3 to 11. Mm. So the only way that I could really spend time with him was that uh, when he got home, I would sneak out of bed and start watching Law and Order or L.A. Law with him <laughs> while eating a half pint of ice cream, which may or may not have formed me in some significant way. I don't know. 
um, but it was it, it was actually both my parents um, from pretty much day one determined that they didn't care what my brother and I did, but we were going to have to get our high school degree and our college degree. Wow. And anything short of that for them, unless there was some extraordinary circumstance, was a failure on their part. They were not going to allow it. Wow. And they did everything yeah. that they could, and they said, you do everything that you can. And right. I, I can tell you from my student loans, we did everything that we could. But that always shaped me. It was really, really important yeah. from that early time. Education and God were super, super important. Right. I had to go to church. And right. it's funny, Montique, because we had the opposite yeah. situation because of a church hurt situation that we mm. had. Uh, the church chose my mom instead of my dad. So for most of my life, it was my dad who used to be the lead singer in, in the church okay. who stayed home. Wow. wow. And and then I and my mom and my brother would go to church. church. Wow. But we had to go. Right. It wasn't right. all. I, I, right. I tried to fake it right. every possible way. And she, she would take the temperature in the arm and the mouth, make sure that we're actually doing what we're supposed to do. Freddie, funny so. you talk about faking it. My mom, <laughs> true story. Every Sunday, once my grandmother, my grandfather brought me home, my sister and I, mm-hmm. she would say, so tell me what you learned in church. Mm. Yeah. So oh. if there was that accountability oh, that's yes. built into, yeah. What that's did the, it. What did the pastor talk about? <laughs> what did you learn? Wow. And um, you all can tell I'm shy, not. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Or even worse, what Bible verse did that's you right, learn? Right, right. Which is like, I really got to pay attention now. now. One of the things that both of you mentioned, one of the things both of you mentioned, is the impact yeah. of your parents Absolutely. on your life. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Heavily involved, right. heavily in- influential, right. pointing you both to God mm-hmm. Absolutely. and to education. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So one of the questions I have for you, when was the first time, when was the first time you became aware of your ethnicity and race being a factor yeah. in your life? Either of you. I mean, um... I, I can think of two moments where I guess the earliest, earliest was I think I was maybe six or seven mm-hmm. um, because my dad was really, really worried, even from a very young age of my brother and I getting into situations where we might end up dead. Mm-hmm. Like he would say it all the time. I mean, and, and, you know, he, he was always watching the news or something. And so there was always this constant mm-hmm. kind of panic. But one thing he was just like, look, there's this place. It's called Coleman. And if mm-hmm. you're found there and it's dark, you may never return. Wow. And I was like, well, why is that? Wow. I mean, all I knew was video games. So I'm thinking, like, is that when the boss comes out or something? I'm not mm-hmm. knowing what's right. going on. But he was like, no, no, it's just because it's because you're black. It's because you're color. You, you may not make it. Wow. And so that, I, that was, I think I was like six or seven. And then when I was in fourth grade, there was a girl that I really liked. Um, I think I think she was digging me too. I'll be honest. <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. Everything worked out. Danielle is amazing. Um, but she happened to be white, and we would sit together and lunch all the time. We'd sit together at the library. We would always pass notes, and we talked all the time. And then one day she stopped talking to me completely. Next day, nothing. Wow. A week later, nothing. So two weeks later. I'm like, what's going on? I thought that we were going to get married or something or whatever it is that kids think themselves going to do. (laughs) And she told me point blank, my daddy told me I can't talk to niggers. Mm. And so not only did I know what my color Mm. was, but I also knew that there was some sort of weaponized form Mm. of my color, that I I was this really bad version Mm. of my color. And I I cried for a while. So that was, I, I guess, like somewhere between... Six and eight. Yeah, fourth grade wow. is somewhere around eight, nine or so yeah. years of age. Yeah. Oh, my. Mandiqua. You know, I think for myself, <clears throat> and it was very frustrating because my first introduction to, I guess, race or ethnicity came from people that looked like me. Mm. My mom <clears throat> was a reader. Uh, she was very strong in English, and so for her, a lazy tongue was not acceptable. Oh, wow. It, it was just not acceptable, and my mom drilled in me, use your tongue when you speak. Open your <laughs> mouth so that people can understand what wow. you're saying. That's right. So that when you speak, people listen. That's right. 
My friends taunted me and told me over and over that I thought I was white. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or called me an Oreo. Mm -hmm. And that hurt my heart because as a child, right, your friends mean everything to you, their yeah. approval. Yes. And yeah. doing what my mom taught me to do, what my mom taught me was necessary mm -hmm. by the people that I should have felt comfortable and protected with. I was an outsider. Wow. Who yeah. do you think you are? Why do you talk that way? Wow. That's right. That's so right. it became <laughs> yeah. clear at that point, you know, Freddie, almost the opposite, trying to be the best version of me. And as a child, that was the only version that I knew oh, sure. yeah. wasn't good enough or wasn't accepted, should I say, by wow. people that looked like me. Wow. Wow. So, so with that being an issue yeah. as a child, what were you told by your family about people of other ethnicities, races, as you were growing up? And some of these discussions like yeah. the N-word being used, yeah. uh, weaponized mm -hmm. in fourth grade. What were you told yeah. by your families about race, race and ethnicity uh, growing up? You know, I think my mom was devout about understanding your worth and the value, but also telling me that I would have to work harder, I would have to be twice as smart to be considered equal, mm -hmm. which I think is why she put so much focus on education. That's right. Also, without saying it, growing up in Inslee and remembering the introduction that I gave you, yes. my mom instilled in me, it is not matter, it doesn't matter where you're from. Mm -mm. It doesn't matter where you go. What matters is what you do. That's right. And I think that was her way of equipping me um, for racism, for discrimination to know there are people that are going to put you down. There are going to people, there are going to be people that think themselves better wow. than you simply because of your zip code. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Freddie, any thoughts from you? So my parents, um, interestingly, they kind of filled uh, these two polar opposite roles. Um, even down to uh, their complexion. And, mm. and as anybody in the black community will tell you, at a certain, uh, black people of a certain age have a certain strata based on mm -hmm. how light you are. That right. and, and at some point it was believed that to be the lighter you were, the better, and the right. darker you were, the better. And my mom would actually tell me stories of how when she, a very light-skinned uh, young lady, started dating my mm. dad, there were people in her own family that would tell her things like, aren't you worried about your kids? Because mm -hmm. they're going to come out just as dark as him. Yeah. So, you know, you have, so you have that, but they also had two different perspectives where mm. my mom was much more, you need to make sure that you're always saying yes, sir, and no, right. sir. Look them in the eye, but don't right. be disrespectful. Mm -hmm. right. Be deferential. Right. Be kind. Mm -hmm. be who you and, and so I interpreted this and I, and I don't think that this right. is what she meant she just wanted me to have as productive a life as I could but I interpreted it as if you want to survive and function and succeed in right. this society that that doesn't belong to you right then you're going to have to count out to it wow whereas right. my dad was more of what you would say is on the militant side mm -hmm. where his idea of teaching my brother and I about race was we watched roots Every single year, from start to finish. Oh my goodness! Where I, I think we all did. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I, Kunta all the way to Chicken scene. George right, and everything in right, the middle, right? right. Uh, I mean, and and so he was much more. He was much more cynical. He mm. was. Uh, he had a harder time believing that there. There was the word "they" that came out of his mouth more towards white people wow. than with my mom. Wow. Yeah. It was like, they are not really going to trust you. You may think so, but they are not going to. Wow. And so you have these two kind of competing things, and, and they're both products of their own their own life. But, yeah, that's, uh, they, they tried to do as best they could, uh, but we, we heard two different mm. and problematic stories wow. um, as kids. I want to get a little bit 
personal here to the degree that you're comfortable sharing. Sure. Um, how have you experienced racism in your life? And how has that experience or experiences, how have those experiences shaped, formed you as an individual? How have they shaped, formed your worldview, your position on the issues we're currently facing as a nation? You want to jump into this one first, Freddie? Sure, sure. I mean, you know, I, I, I talked a little bit about the, the situations before, but I kind of had the, you know, like my dad on my one shoulder and my mom on my right kind of navigating me through things. And mm -hmm. so throughout my life, based on what they told me, as soon as I got old enough to kind of have some autonomy about my life, I put it into practice because fear was a big motivating factor for me. Wow. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be <clears throat> successful. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, this is kind of a, a, a side issue, but from a young age, I, I saw beauty as a particular type of construct. And so mm. I really wanted to, to be a part of the society that I saw on TV. Mm. It's one mm. of the reasons why I became an attorney is because I was so like, oh man, law yeah. and order, LA law, these right. people are amazing. <laughs> right. And even night court, you know, like, uh, and that was like, <laughs> oh, it's a little tough. I, I wanted to be dead, da uh, what, what's the name, John Larroquette, right? <laughs> Um, so, so as, as I started to, to kind of go through high school and college, I was always exceptionally careful the way that I interacted with white people. And I would do what people call code switching. Mm. Uh, right. it, it was very jarring right. for some people, but if I'm right. talking to a black friend, right. I would immediately switch in my right. demeanor and uh, the words I use, the inflection, the body language versus what I would use for a white person because mm. I didn't want to scare the white person. Right. Wow. I wanted them to feel comfortable. Um, when I started to date people and I would date outside my race, which drove my mom crazy. Wow. Every time I would go somewhere with someone who was white, she would cry wow. or be completely fearful because she didn't know if I'd come home that night. Wow. But we never went in any place. <laughs> yeah. It was always going to be takeout. Wow. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. like one or two times, keep it seldom because you just didn't want to antagonize the people around you. And so mm -hmm. that kind of carried throughout much of my adult life. And mm. even even now, as much as I hate to admit it, even now, if I drive into an affluent neighborhood and it happens to get dark, I am terrified on my way back. It's 10 mm. and 2, right on the speed limit. I'm not going to make any mistakes because if I do, and there happens to be that one police officer behind me, mm. who's going to take care of Solon and Declan if I'm not there? And that that sort of strange thought that, weird fear <laughs> mm -hmm. is it's more present than it should be yeah yeah you and i've talked about this a little bit in the past and every time you mention it it hits me in the chest because i'm convinced no man should have to live with that fear but we've talked about it for three years and i know it's very real to you absolutely absolutely the I'm sorry. Um, it's okay, buddy. I think, at least for me, and uh, one of the things that was so hard about the recent events uh, with George Floyd, because we've had we've had these situations for countless right. times. It's right. just too many to it's count. Too many to count. Mm -hmm. And each one chips away a little bit at you, but for mm -hmm. some reason, this one, this one is the one that broke me. Because the sheer humiliation mm -hmm. of a grown man having to call out to his mother mm -hmm. and me seeing the face of my children mm -hmm. and then knowing that even despite that grotesquery, it took protests and riots on a global scale mm -hmm. just to get the beginnings of justice. And to know that my life doesn't legally matter, yeah. that Solon and Declan's mm -hmm. life doesn't legally matter, that's too much. Yeah. It's too much to live with. I'm sorry. Thank you for sharing, Freddie. And I don't want to uh, move on too quickly from that, but yeah. Montequa. You know, what's so <clears throat> interesting is 
some of the beauty of the African American race is that we fight to protect each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a fight that started back in colonial times when the slave tra- slave trade began, mm-hmm. and children, for no reason, um, were taken from their mothers. Husbands, for no reasons, um, were ejected from the family, and. The resolve, uh, the tenacity to fight to protect um, each other, our lives, um, is in some cases innate in us today. So while I will say I am not a person of violence, and Pastor Chris, I think you and I talked about this a little bit, Mm. I can tell you I understand what fuels yeah. um, what fuels that innate desire to say, I have talked, I have prayed, I have cried, I have attempted to use the legal system. Yeah. I have utilized every channel that I've been told, told to use, um, known to use, and nothing has worked. So now I'm taking it into my hands. And that, unfortunately, is why we see um, protests now turn to riots. And it is difficult for me to care about a building when life wasn't cared for. That's right. Mm. That is the feeling that I myself as an African-American woman, I struggle with Mm -hmm. because I think I have a brother. I I have two brothers. I have nephews. I have friends that I love. And the reality is what Freddie just described. Like literally yesterday, I was driving home from work and I work in Mountain Brook, so I'm coming up 280. I see an African-American man that um, appears that there might be um, a disconnect with his mental comprehension. Mm. And I see police Mm. SUVs. And for the first time in my life, I said, I need to stop because I want to make sure that Birmingham doesn't end up on the news for beating or taking the life of another African-American man. Since the George Floyd case, it's the first time, Pastor Chris, that I have felt I need to intervene (laughs) because he may not be safe. Yeah. And... I think what's most jarring is the system that was dedicated to protect and serve. They aren't protecting. They're not protecting. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, the reality is something different has to happen because um, it is more than enough. Yeah. We, we, we've exceeded enough. Yeah. We've exceeded far <laughs> um, beyond enough. Yeah. And so, you know, while funny, when you mentioned Coleman, yeah. I can remember this. Um, my mother was a housekeeping supervisor, mm. children's hospital, wow. very humble very humble profession and for us going to atlanta was the creme de la creme (laughs) and i waited you know for six flags (laughs) it was like yes it is on highlight of the year highlight of the year and then when white waters came it was like oh yes (laughs) we made it big and i remember um i will never forget this was Heflin County. Mm. And my stepfather, just because 
Um, if you've ever been to Six Flags or if you've been to Walt Disney World, just think about that in the lines and the heat <laughs> yes. all day and you yeah. are exhausted. Right. Yeah. And the only thing, you know, we wanted to do was get home. Yes. Mm. And he was driving a little too fast, not intoxicated, not enough for reckless driving, but just a little too fast. And we were pulled over in Heflin County. Mm. And my mom was terrified that we may not make it home. I remember that mm. as a child. Wow. And thank God hmm. we did, yeah. right? Yeah. Thank God, yeah. you know, my stepdad was not harmed, but my mom, whom you heard how we spoke of my mom and you met my mom, mm -hmm. she was a strong lady. Yes, I felt her fear. I felt the fear of a grown man that was just trying to take his family home. Yeah. Because Heflin County was notorious for not liking black people. So That's right. one of the questions I want to ask, are you afraid? Are you literally afraid if you're pulled over by an officer, I, either one of you? You know, Pastor Chris, I, in the incident that I just shared, I honestly feel that I'm more afraid for Freddie than I am for myself. Mm. But when you think about Breonna Taylor, mm. whom was innocent, it mm. says black women have cause to be fearful as well. That's right. You know, I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to be raped. I don't want to be mistreated. Yeah. So I will say I am acutely aware. Okay. I am acutely aware of what could happen now. Yeah. For me, that doesn't mean every time I see a police officer, I have a panic attack, but it does say I am acutely aware. So it's hands on steering wheel, music off, it's 10 yeah. and 2. I don't want there to be a reason mm. for an interaction because I can say I don't know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Freddie, what about yourself? We, we've mean, talked about this. So, so. The fear continues. And, and the interesting thing is I've actually I've served as a deputy district attorney. And, and so my main witnesses for many of the cases, I had a docket that, that centered around uh, uh, DUIs specifically. So my main witnesses were police officers and sheriffs and state troopers. I built amazing relationships with these individuals. Uh, some of which, you know, I, I still have as, as my Facebook friends and will like trade a, a message here and there mm. today. And I'm still afraid because while I've been there, I've also I read a number of the reports, mm. <laughs> uh, a number of the reports where people have been assisted to the ground with force. And then I see the picture of the 14 year old kid because I was also in addition to working the DUIs, I was in the juvenile department. That was my mm. main center. And I saw so many different young African-American young boys who had some really, really interesting intake photos. Mm. Um, and it, it broke my heart. So between that and I think I, I was only there for about 10 or 11 months total. It, it broke my heart. Wow. Between that and, and being asked to try... 15, 16 year olds as adults. It's a lie. Which happened frequently. Yeah. yeah. It was, I, I wasn't cut out for that. What's, what's very interesting, I'm, I'm looking at two people who, by every standard, every standard, you're, uh, you've succeeded yeah. uh, educationally, professionally, in your careers. The difference, I mean, Montequa, yeah. you're in, extremely involved yeah. in humanitarian causes. Right. And my friend, I mentioned him two weeks ago in a message, uh, John, John Reed. And John is another, just, just an incredibly educated, highly professional man. But he communicated to me that I am scared. And how can I not be? And I look at him and I would never think that of him because he's such a 
a beautiful right. man. Right. Uh, so I'm so sorry that this is the fear. Let's, let's talk for a few moments about, and I'm losing track of time, so Chris Miller may have to help us keep up with time because right. the conversation is, is very uh, helpful to me right. to learn. I want to talk a few minutes about the history of the oppression of black people. <laughs> Slavery, Jim Crow laws. It is incredibly important to remember we are only 65 years removed from that day when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. And this is stunning to me. Ruby Bridges. Hmm who was the first African-American to attend an all-white school in Louisiana, is only 65 years old. <laughs> only 65. So this is recent history. Right. That's what's critically important That's right. to remember. What does the weight of this history of oppression do to a black man, a black woman? How has it affected you? You know, Pastor Chris, for me, um, I view it in two ways. I think about when slavery was abolished and to a people that had been oppressed, you, it felt like it should have been jubilant. Mm. But what happened mm. was slavery was abolished and then Jim Crow picked up where slavery left off. Mm, that's right. And so for me, I feel like when you you cut the head off the monster, but another monster mm -hmm. rises up. Mm -hmm. So it says, right, progress is not truly progress. Mm. It's not truly progress, it's a pacification. Mm -hmm. yeah. I cannot wear a white hood anymore <laughs> because you now know that I'm a Ku Klux Klansman. Mm -hmm. But what I do is I put on a suit, I have an Ivy League degree, and I talk about wanting to maintain the supremacy of the white race over all other races. That's right. Mm -hmm. So to me, it says progress is not truly progress, yeah. it's pacification. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. When I hit, that's how I feel. That's right. You know, that's, if it's just being <clears throat> candid and raw, yes. that's how I feel. It's yeah. pacification. Wow. The flip side to that, though, okay. not to take us down the pessimistic road, <laughs> is because I believe in God. God is not weak. He is not mocked. His word will not return Amen. void. That's right. I do believe, I still believe, there is hope. Even when I think about the current climate yes we see i think people of different socioeconomical statuses that's right. people that don't look alike that's right but they have found cause to unite to say we will not stand for this yes i may be late to the party but i'm here <laughs> And yeah. I will yeah. not stand for this. And that is what gives me hope. Wow. Yeah. When you see white women yeah. marching for George mm. Floyd, yes. when they say, when he called out for his mother, that was a cry that every mother heard. Yes. That gives me hope. Yeah. That gives me hope that whether mm. it's defunding the police or getting new administration, and I'll leave it right there, mm. there is hope. Mm. Mm. There is hope. Oh, I, I, I just, Montego, you better preach. <laughs> um, you you mentioned uh, Ruby Bridges. Yeah. It's hard to imagine until I actually looked into it what that little girl went through as a six-year-old. Mm. I have a six-year-old too, Declan. Yeah. He's like me. Mm. We both have a smart mouth. 
<laughs> Neither of us <laughs> would have been able to do what she did because yeah. she faced these adults. There were yeah. rows of adults screaming hateful obscenities and calling her the N-word. And she's six yeah. as she's, she's escorted by, I think, on the first day, her mom and National Guardsmen, because it took actual National Guardsmen to get in there. Um, all of the teachers, uh, all of the parents told the teachers that none of their kids could be in the same room with her. And so she sat in a room alone. <laughs> and none of the teachers at the time in that school would teach her. So they had to bring in a teacher from a whole separate area, and she stayed in that place alone. She refused to even eat food from that place because she was screamed and told on a regular basis, they're going to put rat poison in that mm -hmm. and kill your little tail. Mm -hmm. She's six. Yeah. No adult should have to do that. Right. Yeah. But a six-year-old? But where's the hope? Yeah. The hope is that she's still here. Yeah. The hope is that she is still alive and that her sacrifice and going through that, and I'm sorry, it was, it had hell. to be hell. Yeah. Yes. Every day. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Allowed me to be where I am, to be able to not just go through my schools, but to also get my law degree and yeah. try to help other people. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so I have a lot of hope, not just because, as Montequa beautifully said, we have allies. Yes. Yeah. And let's be honest, there's, there's no movement if only the oppressed people That's right. are shouting. That's right. Because they're oppressed. That's right. They don't have enough political will or force to change the situation because otherwise they already would have done have. it. They would have, right, right. Hmm. So between the fact that there are allies right. also marching, I was involved in a march just this Sunday hmm. at Kelly Ingram Park. Yeah. Where I had my, 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 two, my two boys were out there. They were marching with me. Yeah, I have I have a lot of hope. Yeah, Please. I have a lot of hope. So it's yeah. it's mixed, and yeah. I think you you get where you need to because you have to understand the history Absolutely. that's there. Absolutely. We can't just sweep it under the rug. We can't just pretend it's not there. We can't just right. reconcile right now without right. acknowledging right. what happened. Right. They have the mural in Kelly Ingram Park of those two those uh, is three vicious dogs that were mm. used to attack the rioters and the protesters, mm -hmm. the African-American mm -hmm. protesters and the allies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when Solon was walking up to it, his first instinct was, ooh, doggies, because he loves yeah. dogs. Yeah. And then we told him what the dogs did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he sobbed mm -hmm. uncontrollably for about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. He was like, why would someone do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I told him, that's... Yeah the past that's yeah. the history it's important to know it right. but we're past that now right. and we will never go back that's right mm -hmm. so the fact that that's i can right. tell him about it mm -hmm. right. as a historical fact right is hope in and of itself that's right we have made progress i agree that's right. but there is so much more that needs so to be much. done amen um let me ask this question what does the phrase Black Lives Matter mean to you? And from your perspective, why do you think that phrase is polarizing to some people? Black Lives Matter for me is similar to this situation. When I stub my toe really, really hard, I don't rub my elbow. <laughs> <laughs> my toe hurts. That's right. An entire people felt humiliated and hurt. Yeah. Not just because of what happened, but how long it took for something mm -hmm. to be said about it. Mm -hmm. The fact that Ahmad Arbery mm -hmm. <laughs> somehow went from just walking mm -hmm. to dead. To dead. To possible trespasser, but we don't know, but maybe, but maybe. And that's enough in some people's minds to justify the fact that, well, maybe he deserved it. 
Maybe he deserved just a little bit. Maybe I mean, he, he was looking in that house. I live in Chelsea. If that's the case, then I know about half of the people in Chelsea Park are not going to make it because we all go in those houses when I they're there. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I've been on construction site so many times. I'm just yes. saying, yes. The, but yeah. the, the rush to, to justify it hmm. is more insult to injury. Yeah. Wow. And so in these moments of intense pain, the statement of Black Lives Matter it's simply a necessary solidarity of a mm-hmm. broken people. Mm-hmm. Because what happens when someone's hurt in a family, the family comes together Absolutely. to try and comfort them. Yeah. Montique, anything you want to add? You know, Freddie said it so eloquently. Um, I don't know that I can add to it. Um, but he is absolutely right. It is solidarity. Mm-hmm. It is solidarity. It is, you need to see me. Yeah. You need to hear me. Yeah. You need to know that I matter. Yeah. I exist. Yeah. You know, I'm not cattle. Mm-mm. I'm not ransom. I am a human being, you know, created by a loving God. Yes. I matter. And so it is simply a cry of solidarity. Yeah. Um, let's talk about blind spots for a moment. And then I want to move to this conversation about faith and race. Yeah. But I do think it would be helpful to talk about blind spots. A blind spot doesn't mean I don't want to see something. Yeah. It means I can't see what I'm missing. Mm-hmm. With that in mind, what is something that you think is a blind spot? Something that is generally missed or misunderstood by white people? when it comes to the experience and lives of black people in America? In other words, from your perspective, what are some of our blind spots? I even think, um, as Freddie and I just talked about Black Lives Matter, and if you look on social media, typically there is a person of non-African American descent that will quickly say, all lives matter. That's right. Well, we agree. (laughs) All lives absolutely matter. Could I pause right there? Absolutely. When you say black lives matter, there is no inference that all lives don't matter. Absolutely. You would think that. You would commit to that. You would think, think, Pastor Chris, but when we talk about blind spots, Mm -hmm. scotomas, or you're just too ignorant to know any better. (laughs) Mm. You choose. Yeah. For someone to come back and say all lives matter. Sure. Is the complete, you know, it's, it is not even remotely, you know, what was said. There was never an inference that all lives don't matter. matter. I am saying at a large number, Mm -hmm a disproportionate number of black lives are taken Mm -hmm. in this case at the very hands of the people that were charged to serve and protect. That's right. That's right. And it's like, if that's one thing that we could help um, enlighten or increase the understanding it's not that all lives don't matter. It's I need you to understand that I am a Mine part does. of the all. That's right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> I'm that's, a part yes. of the that's all. so important. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and I, I, thoughts I, that you think you can help us understand? On the on the on that same subject. Talk that, about anger. <laughs> <laughs> it's like she looked into my eye and she saw. It. Um on that same subject, when we're talking about the the almost um, Pavlovian response of all lives matter, I get it, frankly. No one wants to be uncomfortable. <laughs> no one wants to feel that they themselves have either A, been able to benefit from a country and systems within that country that have put them where they are while others have not or b that they have 
remained ignorant of another group of people's misery for right. as long as they have. Right. But it's there. So I get that there is a blind spot when it comes to the Black Lives Matter, all lives matter. Mm-hmm. Because it's it's a defense mechanism of not wanting to hurt. Mm-hmm. But what an irony is that? <laughs> because it's the only reason why I'm mm-hmm. shouting it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to hurt either. either. Mm. I don't want yeah. to die. That's right. I don't want that if something happens that there is no response unless people in Paris, Belgium, and Toledo mm. all protest. Mm. Right. Right. That that sort of um I was talking with a friend and they were really quite shocked at the degree of my hurt cuz they asked me how I felt and I said I have to be honest. It's a combination of despair yeah. and rage. Yeah. And so when we talk about blind spots, sometimes they are they are a defense mechanism, but they I, I, both intentional and unintentional have to be examined as we move forward towards some sort of solution and as we go about the process of understanding what has happened and trying to plot a new course forward to prevent us from being back here right. in another four to six years. years. Absolutely. Eric right. Garner was 2014? Yeah, thereabouts, yeah. And he says the same words, <laughs> I can't breathe. I can't breathe. breathe. Ab- absolutely. And here we are again. Yeah. Hmm. We shouted yeah. it then. But that wasn't enough. So we have mm-hmm. to shout it here. Right now. And we have to shout past the blind spots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because we can't wait mm-hmm. for people to willingly. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. I need to mm-hmm. change the way I'm thinking. <laughs> I know changing the way one thinks is hard. Mm-hmm. And I know that thinking that you had any part in a, in a negative system is painful. But I have no place of hatred in my heart for anyone. I just want people to know that this system exists. Mm -hmm. Mm. It's real. To stop delegitimizing it by making me look at either all lives matter or worse, Mm -hmm. reminding me of (laughs) black on black crime. Right. Which has also been happening significantly. Right. Which is, if I use the metaphor from before, is I stub my toe and then I intentionally hit my elbow with a hammer so I don't feel the toe. Hmm. Anybody who grew up in a black neighborhood knows we're not really happy with with the crime that exists there. Right. I, I heard gunshots just about every weekend. It was a fact of life. We actually had a um, we had a family reunion one year, and my dad comes in because this has happened so many times before, and he's like, "Well, somebody stole my truck again," and we all just mm-hmm. laugh. <laughs> Like, we didn't like that either. Right. But that doesn't absolve the system of what's happening now. Yes. Right. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then move to faith. Thank, thank you so much. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. You, p- well, please do I'm not sorry. be yeah. sorry. Man, we want to hear from you, Freddie. Yeah. We need to hear from you, brother. That's right. Uh, let's talk about the role of media in the racial tension going on in America. Does it play a significant role? You know, I think that the media does play um, a significant role. Point in case, Aubrey, whom the initial story was he was out for a jog, minding his own business. That's right. Uh, he was chased. He was chased and killed, Pastor Chris. Yes. But the media somehow spawned that to make it appear that he was trespassing, <laughs> which clouds a story that doesn't need to be clouded. That's right. And I think that the media should have a responsibility to report truth. Mm -hmm. 
not fake news Mm -hmm. to get ratings or, or as if this is some sort of reality show. Yes. No, yeah. this is a innocent life that was taken. Yeah. Right. And so I hold the media accountable for some of the garbage that it puts out for its own self um, satisfaction right. for ratings. Yes. That's right. So I think the media absolutely, right? I think the countless stories that I didn't see on the local news that I found in other places where white officers kneeled and prayed with protesters. But the media didn't tell that story Mm. because they didn't see that one as newsworthy. Mm. The one they showed showed officers with tear gas. Mm. Right. So I think that the slanting that the media um, displays and portrays daily intensifies racial tension. Yes, yes. Yeah. Intensifies it. So, M- Montequa, one of the thoughts I have, uh, I've just become grieved by media. Yeah. And I'm having to limit my intake of not only news, but uh, movies, TV, reality TV. Yes. Social media yes. seems to be a toxic wasteland. <laughs> and I am that far <laughs> from just <laughs> abandoning it. So a question that I've been forming in my mind is this. Do Christians need to regularly ask themselves, is what I'm listening to or watching helping me or hindering me from becoming more and more like Jesus and loving my neighbor more? Absolutely. Because if it's not, if, if, if it's not helping us in those pursuits, yeah. it does become toxic. It becomes toxic. Um, Let's talk about faith. Oh, we need to move to hope, don't we? Yes. <laughs> Let me just say, yes. uh, before we move here, in this conversation, we may have to splice it into two different episodes, but sure. this is critical. I believe in a concept called identificational repentance. Hmm. Identificational repentance. Hmm. And it's taken from passages like Nehemiah chapter 1. When Nehemiah hears about the ruins of Jerusalem, he sits down, he weeps and mourns for, mm-hmm. it says, a certain number of days. Yeah. Doesn't even tell us how, how long. many. Yeah. Yeah. But when he begins to repent, he says, I repent for my sin, mm. the sins of my ancestors. Yeah. And he repents in a way as if you would believe he was directly responsible mm. for what occurred in Jerusalem. Well, the fact is, he had been in exile. Mm. Sure. He had been a slave. He was not living in Jerusalem. He was working as a prisoner in the court of the king. Mm -hmm. But he identifies Mm -hmm. with the oppression Mm -hmm. of that group of people. Mm -hmm. And he begins to pray a prayer of repentance for sins he had no direct Mm -hmm. part in. And it's really interesting. After that prayer, walls that have been in disrepair for 72 Mm -hmm. years Mm -hmm. are rebuilt once he returns to Jerusalem in 52 days. <laughs> Could there be a yeah. direct tie between his willingness to own yes. mm-hmm. and repent for sins he was not personally responsible for and the breakthrough and the rebuilding of those walls? And I wonder, that that's one of the things I, I don't understand about mm-hmm. Christians. Mm-hmm. I actually stood on the Mall of Washington, D.C. with almost one million men wow a very ethnically diverse crowd. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we were there was for racial reconciliation. Mm. And a part of that gathering was this identificational prayer of repentance where we found an African-American brother or a Native American American brother, uh, someone of a minority. And we went through a process Mm -hmm. of identificational repentance. Wow. And if I could call on the church to do anything, hmm. it would be Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called oh, by my name will humble themselves, yes. right. if they will turn from their wicked ways, yes. if they will repent, yes, yes, I will hear from heaven, that's right, and I yeah. will heal their land, that's yes. right. And I feel this yes. just craving, yeah. 
that we need this. Yeah. So let, let's talk yeah. about faith from your perspective. I'm sorry yeah. for my little diatribe no, there. No, thank no, you. Preach, That's preach. That's, That's what right. you do. That's right. You're the shepherd. Come on. That's on. right. A2 Church Yeah. is a diverse church. But approximately 70% of our congregation is, is white. What do you wish our white congregants knew and understood that we may not know and understand? It goes back to what you literally just said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have to understand what it is we're turning from Mm -hmm. and then turn. In Acts chapter 3, you have this amazing passage of repent Mm -hmm. so that, A, your sins will be forgiving. Mm -hmm. That's right. But more importantly, so that a time of refreshing yes. will come from the Lord. Yeah. Yes. But you can't get your refreshing <laughs> until you do your repenting. <laughs> That's a sermon. Yes, Freddie. <laughs> and so, again, yeah. I, I, that is one of the hardest things to do as a person. Mm. Mm. David had God's heart. Yeah. But had to basically get straight up shamed by Nathan, yeah. his best bud, before he even recognized what he did. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We have to come to grips with, even mm-hmm. though I may not be exactly part of the system, even though I didn't actually do the thing to you that you are confessing to be hurt by, because we are one body, when a part of the body hurts, yeah. The whole body, the body hurts. hurts. We all must identify with the hurt, not right. discredit it, not help to create in a part of the church body, in the black part of the church body, this hmm. form of psychosis, because you've told me that what I'm saying is a figment of my imagination, and I have to second guess who I am while I worship. Choosing then between the Holy Spirit moving and the rage that's always there. Mm. Mm. We are one body. That's right. And we all hurt together. That's right. That's right. And we can all turn together. That's right. And not only can we get the time of refreshing in our church, but then we will go and be the lighthouses that we were called to be in the first place. Well, that's beautiful. Yeah. We've already seen the really, really tough circumstances Mm -hmm. and outcomes that can have when there is misunderstanding. (laughs) Right. And in turn, church hurts Mm -hmm. in a church. Mm Mm-hmm in recent events in this very city. Mm -hmm. Mm. But the church can heal, too. Yes. And in fact, it's supposed to be the hospital for souls. It's supposed to be the first place we heal. Right. Right. Freddie, do I hear you saying, because this, this stimulated out of this, what do you wish white congregants knew and understood that we may not know? It seems that you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, Give us permission to weep and weep with us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. More yeah. with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me tell you the story of how, how this, why this feels that way. Let me tell you why I'm worried about my kids. Let me tell right. you about why I'm worried about my life or why I don't, I, I don't shop in stores unless it's Target because I feel safe at Target. <laughs> but I, don't, I wouldn't go to Nordstrom's. Mm. I wouldn't mm. go to any sort of high dollar because I, don't, I used to work at Parisian. I used to work in Belk. Would never do it because I hate being followed, and it mm-hmm. happened almost every time, and I just mm-hmm. got sick of it. Let me just tell you, mm-hmm. and then let my humanity reach into yours, since we already have a common bond in Christ Jesus. Right. And let that overcome the discomfort of whatever right. part of the guilt you feel you have, <laughs> because your guilt isn't the focus. I don't. I don't want your guilt. I think I'm fairly strong in saying that none of my African-American friends right now want guilt. Mm-mm. Guilt in a quarter won't get me it a grape yeah. It, <laughs> it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. Wow. It doesn't do anything. I want your help and right. your hand. Right. And to cry 
on your shoulder and then to move in one direction with yeah. you. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's what I yeah. want. That's powerful. Yeah. Antique with anything you want to add? You know, that's the second question that, you know, Freddie has just nailed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. You know, but I, I think, um, you know, just to add to that, and I can say um, A2 Church for me personally has, oh gosh, harvested, produced so many beautiful yes. relationships. Yes. So many beautiful relationships. Mm. Um, different ethnicities, yeah. yes. people that I truly, I don't have to say believe, I know love yeah. me. Yeah. Yes. I know love me. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I know that I love them. Yes. Yeah. So I would say because I'm hurting doesn't mean that I'm angry at you. Mm-mm. Wow. Mm-mm. Right. It doesn't mean that I am angry with you. No, I am angry at the system. Yeah, I am angry at the perpetrators yeah. that inflicted yes. the pain. Right. The suffering. I'm not mad at you. Wow. And I think to to my Caucasian brothers and sisters, that's what I want them to know. Wow. I'm not mad at you. Don't feel like, well, should I speak to her today? Should yeah. I not speak to her today? <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, how should I feel? Yeah. yeah. If I love you, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. love you. Yes. That's yeah. you know, that's not going to change, you know, unless you the person. But <laughs> 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 Man, oh do like goodness. a 30 day mute on Facebook, right. but we still good. So yeah, I think that's important. <laughs> yeah. You know, don't uh don't fear me. Mm-mm. You know, don't don't fear me. You know, I'm not gonna come stand on your lawn until you come outside. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do that. Understand, understand the reason for the hurt yeah. and understand that even though hurting I am spiritually and emotionally mature enough to assign that hurt where it belongs. Yes. Yes. Let me let me ask you a question. And I'm so glad we're having this conversation. Yeah. So I have Thank a you. theory. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And for that. it's it's a theory. Okay. So please let me know if my theory is amiss. Okay. <laughs> but it's that relationships transcend race. Absolutely. Absolutely. And w- Absolutely. What I mean by that is that it's really difficult for me to hate a person or hold on to biases yeah. about a group of people when I have an authentic growing relationship with a person from that group. That's true. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I believe one of the most helpful things we can do to become part of the solution is to take intentional steps Absolutely. to yeah. build relationships Absolutely. with people of color, black, white, Hispanic, Absolutely. Asian, Indian, Absolutely. Pacific Islander, Absolutely. I mean, Native yeah. American, Absolutely. I could go on. Yeah. Right. Do, do you agree with that? 100% yeah. Pastor Chris, yeah. period. Yeah. 100. I mean, what I Straight even up. just shared, yep. you know, I remember um, going through my divorce, 2010, it was, you even did counseling for my ex-spouse and I. I remember. Mm. I remember sending emails saying, Pastor Chris, when is enough enough? Because I wanted someone else to tell me it's okay. Yeah. And I remember um, Shannon Johnson and Teddy, they wrapped me in their arms like I was their mm-hmm. little sister. <laughs> and every... Every step, yeah. Those ladies were right there, yeah. And then I don't know if you remember this, Pastor Chris, but I found out that I had um, endometriosis and may have to have a hysterectomy. And I said, God, this is this is interesting. <laughs> I have no husband, <laughs> you know, I'm by myself. And this church, this church sent food, Mm. flowers, people were rotating. Oh, yeah. Let me visit. You need some company today to the point I had to say, I got enough. I'm okay. (laughs) (laughs) I'm okay. I'm good. I'm I'm good. (laughs) That's Um, awesome. (laughs) 
That's what love <laughs> does. Amen. And I believe in my heart, it wasn't because this is brown Montequa with a pretty smile. <laughs> It was because this is Montequa, my friend, my sister. Yes. That's right. That That's right. needs me. Yes. That needs us. Yes. Yeah. And it is the same reason when other people have gone through their valleys, I mm -hmm. have said, I will speak up if no one else does. Yeah. I will stand if it's you and I standing yeah. alone. Yes. That's what love does. That's yes. right. That's right. That's what love does. Come on. Come on. It has nothing to do with color, nope. where I live, yeah. yes. where I came from. That's love. Yes. And that's God. Yes. Come on. Come on now. Whew. Come on. Thank you, Montequa. <laughs> Amen. Let, let me ask you guys. I'm, I'm going to wrap up with two questions. And uh, any other basic steps we can take? as a church, as individuals, to be part of the solution. Yeah. So, you know, Pastor Chris, I've said this to you in private, so now I'll say it in, in public. Mm. Thank you for your heart. Mm. Yes. Your yeah. humbleness, your sincerity mm. to say, I don't know, but I want to know. That's all we need. That's all I want. That's, that's, that's all we want. <laughs> that's How it. can I stand with you? Yeah. Because I see enough is enough. Yeah. I see that the current trajectory cannot continue that's in this manner. That's correct. Thank you for having this conversation mm -hmm. because it is my prayer that someone else that wanted to ask these questions but didn't have the words yeah. or the courage yeah or the confidence will now feel empowered empowered wow. to do so that's right thank you wow. that's right thank you amen thank you Mandy. thank you you know, this moves it from advocacy to action. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. To action. Yeah. And that's all we want. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I would just like to add this. Hey, <laughs> Montego, right. you are awesome. You're my superhero. <laughs> I want you to autograph one of my kids' foreheads when we finish. <laughs> I'm telling you, when no. Montego <laughs> speaks, it's like Moses like, from we, Sinai. We good. Yeah. yeah. Just, I, I just want to record. Just. Um <laughs> You know, I, and I told you, Pastor Chris, I told you this earlier yeah. and I meant it. And so yeah. I'm going to say it here, too, because yeah. you give flowers to people while they're living. That's right. Mm -hmm. So that's right. This is a untenable position. Yes. For anybody to be in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people with lesser fortitude would stumble. Mm -hmm. But I honestly will say from the bottom of my heart, and I say this not just for me, but I say it from my wife and my two kids whose names you remembered he the second Sunday after having only <laughs> seen them once when even I, their parent, <laughs> mixed up their names. I say this on behalf of the whole yes. Effinger clan. There is no shepherd that I would rather have leading this church yes. during this time this right. than you. Amen. It's hard. Amen. Nobody's perfect, but there is nobody I would rather have as my church leader than you. Amen. And that's what I say. That's we what I got to tell you. We can stop on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, Montequa yeah. and Freddie, I had yeah. another question, but I think I'll save that for another okay. conversation. <laughs> um, I want to wrap up. I want to wrap up with uh, a beautiful prayer I became familiar with just this morning, uh, written by an African-American lady. And... Uh, I think it so summarizes God's heart for this moment. Her name is Phil Phyllis Unikafer. I'm sorry, I'm totally okay. mispronouncing her name. Okay. But she is a colleague of Melissa Helser's, and I love Jonathan and David, uh, Jonathan, David, and Melissa Helser. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, they, we sing a lot of their worship songs here, and yeah. uh, Phyllis is a part of the 18 Inch Journey community. Mm. She's an African American lady and close friend of Melissa's. And this morning they shared this prayer, and I'd like to close with that. Okay. To the father of every family on earth, to Jesus, the great reconciler, to the Holy Spirit, healer of our broken hearts. Yes. Have mercy. 
we bow our knees before you. Yes, God. Thank you that in your love you bring, uh, you, you bring s- sin into the light. Yes. Forgive yes. us as a nation for the darkness of racism that we've allowed to exist yes. in our cities, systems, neighborhoods, and in our view of one another. Have yes. mercy. Yes. Have mercy. Jesus. Carve humility yes. in our souls. Pour the oil of your spirit into our pain, fear, and confusion. Today, empower us to move toward each other in compassion, quickness to listen, honor for the sacredness of every human being that has been created in the image of God. Give us courage to boldly uncover oppression and grace to hear each other's pain regarding race. We reject both division and denial. Amen. We mm. reject the devaluing mm. of human life. Yes. Father, you've given us the ministry of reconciliation, mm. and we cry out to you for guidance and steps to take. Yes. Lord, awaken humble conversations between neighbors and friends mm. across this country. Wash our relationships with healing. Yes. yes. Rebuild trust that has been broken and protect our existing bridges of connection. We join your prayer in John 17. Make us one with you. Give us the endurance and commitment it takes to do the hard work of true unity. Jesus, the one who knows our humanity, Mm -hmm. the one who weeps with us, help us follow you on the narrow road of love. Amen. 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 Freddie Effinger. I love you, Danielle, Solon, and Declan. I thank God for you. (laughs) Montequa, I love you. 15 years, my wife and I think the world of you. And I'm going to affirm today, as you were speaking, I just know this, Montequa. Come on. There is a significant call up on your life. And, and, and it's been there, and both of you have that. But there's a call that's a little different than what you're doing now. Yeah. And I mm-hmm. sense it so strongly every time you speak, and I can't wait to see what God is going to do next. Thank you, Thank you for joining me for the first episode Thank of the Real you. Faith Podcast. Yeah. Love you guys. <laughs> We're over and out. <laughs> you just listened to the very real raw unedited thoughts, feelings, and hearts of two beautiful people, I have the honor of calling brother and sister. As we wrap up this episode, I have a few closing thoughts because the purpose of Real Faith Podcast is that we'll feature conversations on a variety of topics with a view towards how we can apply our faith in God's word to the real challenges we're facing. So here are a few applications from this episode. First of all, thank you for listening. And yes, that is an application. If you listen to the entire conversation, my hat is off to you. Way to go. Scripture talks about the value and importance of listening. Proverbs 18, 13, answering before listening, it says, is both stupid and rude. I know that's a really in-your-face scripture, but that's what it says. And James 1.19 in the message is one of my favorite passages. It reads, post this at all intersections, dear friends, lead with your ears, follow up with your tongue, and let anger straggle along in the rear. That's an incredible word. One psychologist, author, counselor, He describes the power of listening like this. Listen to this. Love, he writes, is listening. Love is listening. Love is the opening of your life to another through sincere interest, simple attention, sensitive listening, compassionate understanding, and honest sharing. An open ear is the only believable sign of an open heart. You learn to understand life. You learn to live as you learn to listen. So thank you for listening. I love what Tim Keller once once said. He said, we could do a far better job at patiently listening. In fact, he said, we should not talk until we can represent the opposing viewpoint with empathy so that a friend with a different point of view says, yes, that's my hang up. 
I couldn't have put it better myself. Only then, Keller writes, should we respond. So thank you for listening. One of the most powerful gifts you can give another human being is the gift of empathic listening. That's listening with feeling. This is how we walk out Romans 12, 15, which says rejoice with those who rejoice, but it also says weep with those who weep. So thank you for listening. That's number one. Number two, make it your goal to pursue understanding. You know, understanding is essential when it comes to this subject matter. One of the biggest complaints I've heard from people of different ethnicities is they just don't seem to understand. They don't even want to understand. On the other hand, when two people connect and pursue understanding, people walk away from that kind of interaction saying something like this, I feel so understood. They actually listened to me. They wanted to understand. Unfortunately, when it comes to different ethnicities, many of us try to tell people who are different from us how they ought to be, how they ought to feel, what they ought to do, what they ought to change, and that never works. Stephen Covey was so wise when he wrote decades ago, we need to seek first to understand then to be understood. Proverbs 20 verse 5 says it like this, people's thoughts can be like a deep well, but someone with understanding can find the wisdom there. And there's a lot of wisdom that was shared in this episode. Draw it out. Always make it your goal to pursue understanding. Three, final thought I have for you in terms of application. Always choose honor and civility. I believe this is personal perception here. I believe honor is stronger than racism. Now, I know dishonor is powerful. It's a force to be reckoned with. But in the long march of history, it pales in comparison to the force and power of honor. And honor is one of the things that is severely lacking in the national dialogue we're having right now. Uh, let me make certain you, you know what I mean when I talk about honor. Honor assigns value to someone, regardless of who they are, what they look like, what they've done. It's deciding to place high value, worth, and importance on another person by viewing him or her as a priceless gift because they're made in the image of God. And get this, honor isn't something a person should have to earn. Honor is a gift that's given, and it's a decision that we make every day. And the Bible says this, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Honor is one of our core values at A2. We say it like this. I'll only read you part of it. Honor is our gift. We honor up. We honor down. We honor all around. So let me give you this passage in closing. Uh, it's James 3, 17, 18, but the wisdom from above, but the wisdom from above. James has described an earthly form of wisdom, but he says this, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It's also peace loving. It's gentle at all times. It's willing to yield to others. I've got to say that again. It's willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and it is always sincere. The word means authentic. And then I love the way it closes. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and they'll reap a harvest of righteousness. Let's be those kinds of people. Hey, thank you for listening to the first episode of the Real Faith Podcast with Chris Goins. We'll be back next week with another episode. So make sure you subscribe. Make sure you like. I can't wait to talk with you and have another conversation next episode. God bless. Have a great day. This has been the Real Faith Podcast with Chris Goins. Thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next week.